welcome to Watchtower History. What message were they delivering at the time of the convention? One of them was, again, as we saw in those advertisements, a standard to guide the peoples. And so in one of the newspapers, and I think this is paid newspaper advertising because they have a very long article in it. It says, World Reconstruction, a Standard to Guide the Peoples. Judge Rutherford's stirring address in support of resolution. So this article is stating, from and after the year 1919, and particularly from 1922 onward. You know, those are the two Cedar Point conventions. All right, so this is... This is a newspaper advertisement where they give Rutherford's lecture and they give that message of hope. We will get into what that message of hope is very shortly. This is actually from the New Era Enterprise. So this is not paid advertising or anything. This is from the Bible Student newspaper of the time period. So the May 15th, 1932 Watchtower has a letter because they used to publish letters back in the day. And this one mentions mentions Rutherford's book, Light. And I like that they say, we shall have to study the fourth trumpet. Revelation 8, in light, we delight to feed upon the truth and also to pass it on to others. And so they were very curious about this particular convention because Rutherford makes a big point about it in light. And in a lot of the Watchtower articles, articles to come to follow, as, as we saw earlier. Here you are again. They're, they're following his ideas. I mean, they're the way these letters, to me anyway, um, I don't know if you feel the same way, Jeff. I don't want to put words in your mouth. But here they are believing his personal books. He's writing books on the Bible, what he's translating it to be. And here's people delighted to feed upon the truth. That he's without, dispensing. Uh, I'm, without I'm sorry, questioning I'm anything. Shocked. Yeah, I'm just shocked about it. I'm, it. It's amazing how just people, I, you know, I could see if you're born into it. And if you don't know the Bible, I guess, because Jehovah's Witnesses do appear to know the Bible. But nobody really knows the Bible. So when you talk to them, they know a little bit. That's a lot more than what they know. But when they go up against somebody who knows the Bible, they have to shake the dust off their feet. <laughs> and flee from your doorstep because they, they can't go toe to toe with someone who knows the Bible. And then on top of it, you get people like you and I, who not only know the Bible more than them, but also know their religion more than them. <laughs> and, and here you go, you could go back and forth with them. I, I've been with people talking, they don't know what their own religion is teaching them. And I laugh when it's done. Oh, well, I guess I just taught you how to be a Jehovah Witness. Mm. And th that that's where you go. You get people just following, believing these are trumpet trumpet blasts. But if again, if you go back to these trumpet blasts and you look at the reasoning they're using for it back then and after, you know, you start to realize what was the evidence for it? What was the things that they were saying at the time? And does it really, really make any sense? You start to see things they're associated with. The 15th. September 15th, New Era Enterprise has Rutherford's lecture. Right? And so when you look at some of the things they're associated with, it makes me question why. So this article, Rutherford says, religious strife such as exists between the modernists and fundamentalists the Ku Klux Klan, and the Catholic Church, as well as the political upheavals which have rocked the world during and since the Great War, are but the birth pangs of a new day, according to Rutherford. Well, we already saw in our Miracle Week discussion, in our Third Trumpet discussion, they weren't as negative on the Ku Klux Klan as they should have been. And that's happening at these conventions. And very, very we also show they even rented them airtime on their radio station. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, that's true. 
and, and so they were allowing the Klan to promote their their ideas. Another thing that came out of this 1924 convention, the International Bible Students Leader sees the dawn of a new day in religious strife. And here, Rutherford talks about the Klan. So a statement Rutherford made at this convention, he says, I'm neither pro-Klan or pro-Catholic, nor am I against either. I believe in religious freedom and would never countenance interference with sincere belief. Why wouldn't he denounce the Klan and what they stood for? And do they follow that today? Um, I believe in religious freedom and would never countenance interference with sincere belief. Is that followed? Not by the arguments and our articles I see now. That's They would denounce such things. And right? Yeah, I think to... You can say I'm neither, some things you could say I'm neither hot nor cold, but you can't say I'm neither pro clan or, and, you know, you've got it. Yeah. It's something like that. You have to take a stand. If you haven't seen it already, check out our Miracle Wheat discussion for more connections with Watchtower and the clan. Very, very fascinating stuff there. In the Golden Age, there was an article written about the clan. In the uh, New Era Enterprise for February 8th, 1921, Rutherford says, During World War I, the IBSA were badly treated in Oklahoma, but not by these countrymen. Some of them, after the lecture, asked Brother Bonet, what is the attitude of the IBSA towards the Ku Klux Klan? Brother Bonet replied he didn't know much about the Ku Klux, but was watchfully waiting to see what the attitude of the Ku Klux is toward the IBSA and that the Golden Age had recently published an article about that organization, which so pleased the officials of the Ku Klux Klan that they republished the Golden Age article in their own literature. <laughs> now, this is something I did not know. This, this yeah, is that, new to me. Yeah. I've never heard this one. <laughs> and this, 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 uh, drawing, this drawing, this is, this is from the Golden Age article. Uh, so the Klan... <laughs> I never heard this one. This is amazing, Jeff. What, it's what because Bonet was linked to this this statement. It is just absolutely bizarre. So the society has links to the KKK now. <laughs> and no, they, they didn't endorse it. I'm just being you. No, no, they, here. they didn't endorse it because they say, quit trying to scare people with gowns, sheets, and hoods. But on the contrary, I make a vigorous attack on the power causing the evil in our land and other lands. That is to say, big business, the controllers of the destinies of men and women generally, who exercise control and power in the most dastardly manner. The, and, class, and that if, has wrought, the class that has wrought about the very things which you profess to rectify. They were against the Catholic Church. So that's the reason why they're mentioned in the Golden Age, basically, because they were very anti-Catholic and anti-Jewish later. And you can't even hold Rutherford <laughs> accountable for what the KKK <laughs> chose to think was, was a good <laughs> yeah. thing. You know, they didn't in, in, in endorse it, um, but it, it is it is humorous. I find it humorous, to say the least. Even worse, in Canada, they had their own radio station in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. CHUK were the call symbols, and that's the radio station there, and some photos from inside the radio station. So here's a book, On Air Radio in Saskatchewan, by Wayne Schmalls. And in it, it says... Saskatoon's second station, run by the International Bible Students Association, opened in 1924. Basically, they tried to shut the radio down, and this is a little bit of the stories in this book on air, radio in Saskatchewan. In January 1927, the Saskatoon Board of Trade requested that the Bible student station be prohibited from preaching sermons over the airwaves except on Sunday. Yet this event was not important. A letter in the Saskatoon Daily Star showed that the Board of Trade did not support its subcommittee, and 10 numerous letters and petitions were signed by non-Bible students, indicated that the station sermons were reasonably popular throughout Saskatchewan. So they were trying to shut down the station. Why? So in Penton's book, one of his, his first books, and this was written when he was still a Jehovah's Witness, and I've talked to him recently, and he said, you know, this, this could stand to rewrite because he was just trying to defend the society back at that time. And a lot of this also got incorporated into and updated in Apocalypse Delight, which is not completely favorable to the society, of course, but it tries to be accurate to the history and the documentation. So in, in his book, Penton says, 
On January 7, 1927, the radio director for the Department of Marine and Fisheries sent a memorandum to Alexander Johnston claiming that the radio station, Washtower radio station Chuck, was in trouble again. He went on to tell his superior about the Ku Klux Klan programs, which he stated had been investigated by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and reported to the police, to the department by them. So basically, they were selling time to other people and they were selling radio time to the Ku Klux Klan in Canada. And then the Ku Klux Klan broadcast their programs through Watchtower's radio stations. <laughs> This is all new to me. This is, yeah, I never, I never read or heard this. This is, this is good. So, so it's basically like the neutrality. If we can make a buck, we don't care who we make or sell to or for. Yeah, and, and again, it's again that change of perspective of when do they watch how really become money makers? Here's a real good example of that. Is during that Rutherford regime, right? Well, they perfected it in the Nazi regime after I, the KKK. Yeah. So yeah. as we as we've shown from I, I thought it was all rumor. I've mm-hmm. have heard that the society was a little tied to the KKK. Um but I never found any really documentations personally. So I I, I assumed it was a rumor, but based on this, uh if they were selling radio time, <laughs> you know, that that is an affiliation whether you want to call it one or not. Yeah, it's a ridiculous organization. It shows some of that racist background that I think Watchtower had. Not only were, uh, you know, the racism of of the Ku Klux Klan, but their very anti-Semitic statements they got into in in following years. And you can see a little bit of that in our discussion, our neutrality discussion. Here's more on Bonet and his discussion on the Klan. And he claims to not know much about the Klan, but they were pretty quite well known at the time. So instead of denouncing them again, uh, as would have been the best thing to do, he talks about areas of agreement they had. And he ends up, uh, they, they both hate the Catholic Church. He ends up agreeing with them on that. He ends up selling him a book <laughs> by the end of this. So uh, very sad uh connections uh, with Watchtower history. but Another odd statement by Rutherford at this convention. He says, we don't have a membership role. Times have changed. <laughs> now it's difficult to get off the membership role because you're going to lose your family and your friends. It's all about the stats. It's all about the numbers, right? And he says, there are no dues, nor are there any high salary persons making money from it. But the French benefits were excellent. I got a mansion out of it and a couple so, yes, twelve cylinder Cadillacs. A, yeah, maybe you didn't get a salary, <laughs> but when you're driving around in a couple of Cadillacs and a mansion during the Depression, I think you're you are receiving something, making money from it. And so, why is the Watchtower associated with the Klan in in, in a certain sense? We're going to go into that a little more. We've discussed a little bit of it already, but we're going to go into that a little more in the future. Another That's discussion why we, for keep, another we keep saying about following from the very beginning, because it, it's going to end up somewhere. You'll, you'll see. I don't know. If I have a very strong hesitancy to associate with anyone who is involved in white supremacy or Ku Klux Klan or, or things like that. It really... Uh, that's something that when I hear it, I want to run the opposite direction. Fortunately, the Watchtower of today is not like that. They try to avoid racism as much as possible. uh, And they try to be very good examples of that. But some of these things from those early years are shameful, very shameful. All right. So in this lecture, it also says, believes 1914 correct date. But remember what he's doing here in 1925 is taking the earlier 1914 interpretation and applying something new on top of it. He's making it different. So he says, the clear inference is that when the enemy has made the footstool of Jesus Christ, 
Then the Lord will begin his great work of restoring the human race. His first act would be to take possession. The important question then arises, did the world end in 1914? Did that date mark the fulfillment of the time limit? Till he comes, who's right it is? All Bible students believe that 1914 is the correct date. And so he says the first part in the work of the king after taking power is to throw the devil out of heaven. St. Peter describes this conflict and its results saying the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. Fire represents destruction. Therefore, it pictures the destroying of the devil's power to rule from the heavenly position. And then. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier. Um, All Bible students believe that 1914 is the correct date. Remember, people were starting to distance himself and and, and he he was looking and grabbing for straws. Okay, I I believe 1914, but here's more new light. We got more new light on this. So he's still keeping the day, but hey, there's more that that this new light discovered. And you look at it, it's kind of like how when the Romans and the Catholic Church came in and they took over pagan lands, they allowed, okay, we'll mix it so that you could understand it for you. Uh, he was well aware of that. And so he had some foreknowledge to, okay, let me kind of make them all happy until I completely go my direction. And he always had a, a little core to keep that just over the course of a couple of decades, he just removed all the bad in his word, all the evil slave and got all the new people who didn't know why the evil slave were leaving. They didn't know why the evil slave was evil. Yeah. So, so <laughs> exactly. So th- there you go. I think in his own admission right here, there it is, right, not his own admission, but right plain in writing, all Bibles believe that's what they're doing. They're, they're trying to keep the, the core still a little core before they lose everybody. And we saw it a lot of those other articles from the later watchtowers. They keep pointing back to this message of hope as being a year of change. This is a year of all these new directions that they're going. They were pointing at the league of nations, right? So here Rutherford brings a little bit of that in. It says the elements referred to are the commercial, political, and ecclesiastical elements which form the unholy alliance, composing the earthly part of Satan's organization, which now must melt and flow together in one common melting pot in the great time of trouble in the day of God's wrath. The devil expelled from heaven begins to rally his forces to make his final stand on earth, and this is the great day. This is the great battle of God Almighty. And so here's a whole new focus that they're headed towards, all based on his reinterpretation of 1914 and Satan cast out of heaven. And the great battle coming. Yeah. But he's still still holding on to the elements being the commercial, political, and ecclesiastical. He's still holding that. And that that's the what, but but you could see the transition in it. Prior to that, that's what Armageddon was against. That's what the Battle of Armageddon was more or less against. The 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 problems causing mankind problem. He's still holding on to that that. But remember, there is going to be a great war, and there's going to be a great crowd who survive. And there, it's it's little by little just. I like what you said, but what he's doing is he's taking some of these elements Mm -hmm. from what they said before. Now he's applying new interpretations to it. Yeah. So what does he mean by these things? Mm -hmm. And why is he saying those things? That's another discussion for another time. (laughs) We'll get there. (laughs) Here in the September 29th, New Era Enterprise, it says Judge Rutherford speaks to 10,000 at Indianapolis. And I thought this quote was interesting. It says, Judge Rutherford scouted any theory of the destruction of Earth or immortality of mankind. He insisted that teeming millions here will not go to heaven, but will remain here on Earth. He declared that God would never destroy Indiana nor any other part of the Earth, but said that God would bind Satan and set up a kingdom of righteous 
peace on earth. So this is part of his message of hope. This is that trumpet blast. And is again, that what they do? again clinging to the Armageddon being against the 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 political, religious, and and financial system? He would never destroy Indiana nor any other part of the earth. This is against Satan and what Satan's doing. He says these millions would remain here on earth, right? But remember, he's moving from this message of hope that millions now living would never die to the message of hate that millions now living will die. <laughs> and, no, and this, I is, think this is that, yeah, I think this is that transition right there where, where it's going. So I guess technically the fourth <laughs> trumpet was as important as the first one. Yeah, it's really quite enlightening. Very, very enlightening. How do you know, right, that what was that message of hope, what that trumpet convention was? Because they don't report it all in the Golden Age or the Watchtower. You can get it from the New Era Enterprise and from the newspaper records. Then you can get the full story. Otherwise, you're just getting what they're telling you it means or they're, what they're telling you happened. But did it really happen the way that they're claiming? Was that really the message they were giving at the time? As we've been seeing through this whole discussion, it's not. It was completely different. And do they do that today? Have different sources of news? I mean, yeah. th think yeah. about You've got the, here, here's the public watchtower. Now here's ours. I mean, I could see why they wouldn't want the public receiving too soon the stuff they're saying because they won't, you know, they'll look at it and go, oh, my God, you got you got to lure them in, you know, with, with a nice, you know, nice bait. Hey, you live forever. The zebras, the monkeys, pull them in and then you start laying this stuff on them. Um, I, you know, again, I think we said this before in other discussion or we said it privately I mean, could you imagine the, the early Christians reading the letter of Paul's, the, you know, of Paul and Peter and all that? Uh, well, oops, someone's coming in. Switch the letter. Read, <laughs> read this one. I mean, it's why why would you even have a separate one from from the public? I, I can't comprehend that one either. What are you trying to hide? Yeah, that, that's, that's what it says. But, it's like you know, financial it, records. Why, why aren't you transparent? <laughs> it's God's money. <laughs> it's God's organization. I can't imagine. God provided his Bible full. Here, here's your Bible, but I'm going to hide my financial records. I mean, that's in essence what they're saying. Uh, so those are things that always turned me off about um, being or with my grandmother discussing with her and, and stuff like that. Some of these things just make me go, hmm. hmm. And, and, you know, that message of hope being a message of hate. Let's look at that message of hope. Let's right, look at some of the, the details. Here we go. All right. So let's look at some of the quotes in this message of hope. To all peoples of goodwill. So again, in this message of hope, he's pointing at world powers, Science and philosophy, commerce and religion have each in turn offered their respective remedies for man's relief in the name and under the guise of democracy. These combine in offering their joint and several powers to meet the requirements of man. Right? So he's pointing at these things, but he says intrigue, duplicity, and trickery are freely resorted to by the political and commercial powers. Again, back to these these concepts that he's, he's repeating in a lot of these things. And I'll skip down a little bit further. While the religionists, both Catholic and Protestant, are conspicuous of their arrogance, self-conceit, impiety, and ungodliness for the religionists who have missled them. Being guided by the false light of such an ungodly and unholy alliance, the peoples have fallen into darkness. They're like lost sheep scattered upon the mountaintops without a shepherd and are without food and shelter and are made the prey of wild beasts. So he's saying they're the other sheep and they're like sheep without a shepherd. I can be your shepherd, right? That's, that's, 
you know, follow me. Here's the message. Here's the message of hope. What happens if you don't follow him? You're a goat. All right. So let's read a little bit further. Modernists deny God, deny his word, and his plan of redemption. And I find this interesting because if you remember our discussion on the man who dared disfellowship Rutherford, Fisher is the one who objected to Rutherford's sheep and goats interpretation because it was moving away from the idea that every man and woman who ever lived would have an opportunity for salvation in the future. And that every man and woman who ever lived included everybody who was living at that time. Yeah. And, and those who had already died. Yes. So, so he's Rutherford's going down. There's a new path. He's it's this new path of it's all about us. It's only us. It's only, you know, they weren't called the JWs at the time, but it's only the JWs will be saved. That's that mentality that still exists today. And so, This message of hope, as we said, was a message of hate, a message of fear. Join us or die. You know, that this is where the million, again, millions now living will never die became the billions now living will die horribly in Armageddon. So in this article or in this message, he references this idea about that Revelation 12, self-interpretation, right? Where Satan's cast out of heaven in 1914 and the society is, is the chosen one. And so Rutherford says, the greatest crisis of the ages is impending and about to fall because the old world has ended and Satan's lease of power is done. Knowing this and that his time is short, and this is his reference to Revelation 12, the devil is trying to overwhelm the peoples with a great floor of false and deceptive doctrines and to turn their minds completely away from Jehovah. The time has come for God to make himself a name in the earth. And Rutherford was going to try and do just that. He now, again, as we said, pushes this whole concept of the name. Right? This is where he's heading for when he changes the name to Jehovah's Witnesses. And this, why we're covering this, uh, we should probably say for people watching this, is we're going to cover who's going to make that name for themselves, whether it's Jehovah himself, according to the Bible, or Jehovah's Witnesses making that name for him. So this statement right here that Jeff just read is going to come up again. In, in, in again in another discussion <laughs> so so, so th that that's but that's the point there who's who's going to make that that name announced god or rutherford and so again the question we'll have to ask is how is this a message of hope it's a message of hate and that was everything Rutherford was doing from that point forward was just this message of hate, hate against everybody. Just hate, hate, hate. And that's literally why he's kicked off the radio years later is because of these messages of hate. Well, it's like you're, you're, you know, you're a little boy, your mom makes you a chocolate cake. <laughs> it tells you <laughs> if you don't touch that cake, I won't beat you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's li literally what it is. It it's not. Oh, after dinner, I made a such a nice cake for you. You you and your friends all come over. You get to have some chocolate cake. You 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 want to do that? That's not. That's a message of hope. <laughs> after dinner, I'm going to get chocolate cake. What that is is, uh, I won't beat you <laughs> if, <laughs> if you if you, it, it's it, it, yeah. It is kind of the way they twist it in, into a message of hope. It, it ultimately it is for, if you believe for you, you. Yeah. Believe. Yeah. For you. <laughs> Not for everyone else. But yeah. But so um, I, I don't personally understand that logic, but that's me. It's interesting because 
you know, some at the time recognized this message of hope was really a message of hate. I like this little note they have here in the in the paper. It says the convention for Saturday of the convention is the best accounted for in the following report of the Indianapolis Star. Additional reports of books sold on service day continue to come, and it's estimated that close to 20,000 books were sold. On this day, a petition or resolution was read by Judge Rutherford and practice, practically unanimously adopted by the conventioneers. I like it says practically unanimously adopted by the conventioners. Yeah, today if you didn't, if <laughs> well, you just didn't wait, wait, wait. Or raise your hand, they'd be looking at you. Okay, they'd they be you know writing it down. Okay, just Jeff, right. Jeff and Paul <laughs> didn't raise their hand. <laughs> you know, and and you said two, and there were two, and yeah. they're mentioned here. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a prophecy. <laughs> so. On this day, a petition or resolution was read by Judge Rutherford and practically unanimously adopted by the conventioneers. Said resolution containing a message of hope to all the peoples of goodwill for the world. There were but two dissenting votes visible. <laughs> but then notice how they put a judgment on them, right? That was our a, grandparents. <laughs> no, 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 no. Listen, a brother and sister, the former for many years, an elder in a nearby ecclesia, but no longer serving. So they have to put a judgment on, you know, on him. Why is he no Sounds longer like serving? Fisher. Sounds like Fisher. There could have been Fisher, or could have been, you know, uh, you know, anyone who disagreed with, you know, these messages of hate that they were putting out there. Could have been anything. They just put a judgment on the two dissenting votes instead of, you know, maybe there's a reason they they dissented. Looking at what we've seen, I could see there's a big reason for why they dissented. I find it very interesting that. His prophecy, Rutherford's prophecy of the world ending in 1925 and the Jews back in Jerusalem and all that, the new Ur Enterprise of that edition in August of 1925, look at the article below, Palestine looks like boomtown. Yeah. They were watching it grow. They, they were seeing the activity, but... When it didn't go his way, he just had to drop it he, instead of again, like they would tell you to do, wait on Jehovah. <laughs> they went, No, nope, gotta change it. This is what it means now. If we look at Rutherford's early history, you know, before he was a Bible student, he was very involved in politics. And, and as much as they, you know, thought they should remain neutral, I find it very interesting in this 1925 enterprise, you know, that they, they put this article in about. Williams Jennings Bryan passing away. And there's a lot of articles by, about Williams Jennings Bryan or quotes from Bryan throughout the Golden Age and the Watchtower. Uh, it was well known that Rutherford had campaigned for Bryan for many years. And what that entailed, how that relates to Watchtower and Rutherford, what kind of attitudes and what that means going forward is another discussion for another time. But remember this. This is where it all begins now. Thank you again, Paul. This has been a very fascinating discussion. Thank you all for watching. Like and subscribe. Leave some comments. Let us know what you'd like to see in the future. Get a whole story, not just from the Watchtower's perspective, but from all the various splinter groups. What, what were they saying? So until next time, keep reading. <laughs>